the music of india chapter 1 introduction north and south india differ largely in the magnitude of things the north is the land of the fighting races and has the large towns and cities of india with their keen intellectual and commercial life the south is the land of peaceful villages nestling among green fields and gardens inhabited by a conservative and peace-loving people who are contented with a little the south was far away from the battlefields of empire until the time of the british and so has passed through a more peaceful evolution and has clung more closely to the old ways when the muhammadan invasions overwhelmed the cities of the north the sages and seers fled to the forests of the south where they were safe from harm and were welcomed by the cultured dravidians these differences are reflected in the music of the north and of the south though we must not commit the mistake of thinking of these as distinct types of music there is one indian music though there are many ways of working it out and these all groups themselves under the northern and southern schools distinguished as the northern or hindustani school and the southern or the carnatic school both are yet based on the principles stated in the ancient sanskrit thesis on music the student of india will find in the same way one india which speaks again and again as he travels from north to south the atmosphere of the mystical devotion and of submission to which is looked upon as the divine will is found in all religious hearts the one treasure store of legend and story supplies both north and south with heroes and sages and agriculture and trade the village and the home and all the arts are filled with the same spirit and use practically the same methods throughout india once upon a time the great rishi narada thought within himself that he had mastered the whole art and science of music to curb his pride the all knowing vishnu took him to visit the abode of the gods they entered a spacious building in which there were numerous men and women weeping over their broken limbs vishnu stopped and inquired of them the reason for their lamentation they answered that they were the ragas and the raginis created by mahadeva but that as a rishi of the name narada ignorant of the true knowledge of music and unskilled in performance had sung them recklessly their features were distorted and the limbs broken and that unless mahadeva or some other skillful person would sing them properly there was no hope of their ever being restored to their former state of body narada ashamed kneeled down before the vishnu and asked to be forgiven the vedic index shows a very wide variety of musical instruments in use in the vedic times instruments of percussion are represented by the dugdugi an ordinary drum the adambara another kind of drum bhumi dugdugi an earth drum made by digging a hole in the ground and covering it with hide vanaspati a wooden drum they were used to accompany dancing stringed instruments are represented by the khandavina a kind of lute karkari another lute vana a lute of 100 strings and the veena the present instrument of that name in india this one instrument alone is sufficient evidence of the development to which the art had attained even in those early days there are also a number of wind instruments of the flute variety such as tunava a wooden flute the nadi a reed flute bhakura whose exact shape is unknown by the time of the yajur veda several kinds of professional musicians appear to have arisen from lute players drummers flute players and conch players that focal music had already got beyond the primitive stage may be concluded from the somewhat complicated method of chanting the samaveda 
which probably goes back to the Indo. These hymns of Rik and Samavedas are the earliest examples we have of words set to music. Unless we accept the Zindavista, which may have also been chanted. The Samaveda was sung according to the very strict rules and present-day Samaghas, that is the temple singers of the Saman, claim that the oral tradition which they have received goes back to those ancient times. A discussion upon the musical character of the Saman chant will be found in the next chapter. The Chandogya and the Brihadaranyaka Upanishads, 600 BC both mention and the singing of the Samaveda and the letter also refers to a number of musical instruments. One of the earliest references to music is found in the grammarian Panini, who was probably alive when Alexander the Great was in Taxila, 326 BC. In his comments upon the root Nrit, that is to dance, he mentions two persons named Silalin and Krishasvin as the authors of the two sets of sutras on dancing. A reference to a musical performance which, if it could be accepted as historical, would go back further still is found in the Pali Pitaka, 300 BC, in which it is said that the two disciples of Gautam Buddha, 480 BC, attended a dramatic performance which of course would be musical. The earliest reference to musical theory seems to be in the Rik Prati Shakya, 400 BC, which means the three voice registers and the seven notes of the gamut. It is interesting to find that just before the time of Pythagoras in Greece, 510 BC, worked out the musical system of the Greeks. In the Ramayana, 400 BC to AD 200, mention is frequently made of the singing of ballads which argues very considerable development of the art of music. The poem composed by the sage Valmiki is said to have been sung before King Dasharatha by Rama and Lakshmana. The author of the Ramayana often makes use of the musical similes. The humming of the bees reminded him of the music of stringed instruments and the thunder of the clouds of the beating of the Mridanga. He talks of the music of the battlefield in which the twanging and creaking of the bows takes the place of stringed instruments and vocal music is supplied by the low moaning of the elephants. Ravana is made to say that he will play upon the lute of his terrific bow with the sticks of his arrows. Lakshmana, entering the inner apartments of Sugriva's harem, hears the ravishing strains of the music of the veena and other string instruments accompanied by the faultless singing of accompanied vocalists. Ravana was a great master of music and was said to have even appeased Shiva by his sublime chanting of Vedic hymns. The Ramayana also mentions the jatis which seem to have done duty for the ragas in the ancient times. They seem to have been seven in number and may perhaps have begun on each of the seven notes of the gamut. Among the musical instruments mentioned, the following are the most important. Bheri, Duktuki, Mridanga, Ghata, Panava, Dindima, Muraka and Adambara. Clarinet. A veena played either with the bow or with the plectrum, the veena being the name for all stringed instruments. The Mahabharata, 500 BC to AD 200, speaks of the seven swaras and also of the Gandhara Grama, the ancient third mode which is discussed in the next chapter. The theory of consonance is also alluded to. The Mahajanaka Jataka, 200 BC mentions the four great sounds which were conferred as an honor by the Hindu kings on great personages. In these, the drum is associated with various kinds of horn, gong and cymbals. These were sounded in front of a chariot which was occupied but behind one which was empty. At such a time, they sounded hundreds of instruments so that it was like the noise of the sea. 
The Chataka also records how Brahmadatta presented a mountain hermit with a drum, telling him that if he beat on one side, his enemies would run away, and if he upon the other, that they would become his firm friends. In the Tamil books, Purana Nuru and Pattu Pattu, 100 to 280, the drum is referred to as occupying a position of very great honor. It had a special seat called Murasukattil and a special elephant and was treated almost as a deity. So it is described as adorned with a garland like a rainbow. One of the poets tells us, marveling at the mercy of the king, how he sat unwittingly upon the drum couch and yet was not punished. Three kinds of drums are mentioned in these books. The battle drum, the judgment drum, and the sacrificial drum. The battle drum was regarded with the same veneration that regiments used to bestow upon the, the regimental flag in the armies of Europe and the capture of the drum meant the defeat of the army. One poem likens the beating of the drum to the sound of a mountain torrent. Another thus celebrates the virtues of the drummer. The early Tamil literature makes much mention of music. Paripadal 100 to 280 gives the names of some of the swaras and mentions the fact that these being seven ancient Dravidian modes. The yal is the peculiar instrument of the ancient Tamil land. No specimen of it is found today. So it was evidently something like the veena but not the same instrument as the poet Manikavachar mentions both in such a way as to indicate two different instruments. Some of its varieties are said to have had over 1000 strings. The Shilapadigaram 8300, a Buddhist drama mentions the flute player and the veena as well as the book as well as the yal and also has specimens of early Tamil songs. This book contains some of the earliest expositions of Indian musical scales, given the seven notes of the gamut and also a number of modes and ragas in use at that time. The names given to the notes are not those current in the present day and are with one exception pure Tamil words. A Jan lexicon of the same period gives quite a lot of information about early Dravidian music. It mentions two kinds of ragas. Complete or heptatonic means having seven notes and transilient or hexatonic that is six tone, pentatonic five notes which were called pau and tiram. So it gives the 22 shrutis which it calls matra. The Tamil names of the seven swaras with the equivalent Sanskrit initials sari kama padha nisa the seven Dravidian modes called Palai. Four kinds of Yal and the name of 29 Pans, some of which are still found among the primary Ragas of South India. All this as well as frequent references to the science of music and to music performances, both vocal and instrumental, in the Tamil books of these and succeeding periods makes it clear that musical culture had reached a high level among the Dravidian peoples of South India in the early centuries of our era. The later centuries of the Buddhist period, AD 300 to 500, were more fertile in, in architecture, sculpture and painting than in music. The dramas of Kalidasa, AD 400, made frequent references to music and evidently the Rajas of the time had regular musicians attached to their courts. In the Malavika Agnimitra, a song in four time is mentioned as a great feat performed at a contest between two musicians. The development of the drama after Kalidasa meant the development of music as well, as all Indian drama is operatic. The oldest detailed exposition of Indian music theory which has survived the ravages of ants and the fury of men is found in a treatise called Natya Shastra or the science of dancing said to have been composed by the sage Bharata. 
And the date of this book is usually accepted as the early part of the 6th century. It is stated elsewhere that previous to this Bharata had composed the Natya Shastra or aphorisms on dancing, but these have not survived. There is only one chapter of the Natya Shastra, chapter 25, which deals with music proper. This contains a detailed exposition of the swaras, shrutis, grammars, murchanas and jatis. While the principles of his theory are still active in Indian music, the details of his system belong to the past and are not easily intelligible to the present generation. A translation of a portion of this chapter appeared in Mr. Clement's Introduction to Indian Music and there is a complete French translation by Jean Grosset. The letter, however, is not quite an accurate guide as it has taken the word swara used by Bharata for the interval and only secondarily for the note above the interval. This involves the correction of all his translation of note names. An inscription found at Kudumiya Malai in the Purukottai state of the Madras presidency which seems to belong to the 7th century has much references to music. It mentions seven jatis and a few of the shrutis as well as seven swaras. The word antara and kakali are found describing respectively the sharp shrutis of ga and ni, which is one of the peculiarities of the sadhan nomenclature today. It is suggested that, that the inscription is really a piece of the samagha to sing and that the Peculiar marks on many of the note signs may be intended to indicate points of summon singing. The 7th and the 8th centuries of our era in South India witnessed a religious revival associated with the Bhakti movement and connected with the theistic and popular sects of Vishnu and Shiva. This revival was spread far and wide by means of songs composed by the leaders of the movement and so resulted in a great development of musical activity among the people generally and in the spread of musical education. The old melodies to which these songs were sung are now lost, though Travancore claims to have preserved some of them in the ancient Travancore ragas such as Indisa, Indalam, Padi. Puranira. The beautiful strip of land on the southwest coast of India, between the western ghats and the sea of which Travancore is now a part, was framed in the centuries before Christ for its commercial activities and its tropical products. This was then the homeland of the Chera Kingdom, which for a considerable period exercised sovereignty of the whole of South India. And it was also the home of the ancient Tamil culture which rivaled the Sanskrit culture of the sacred cities of North India. It is therefore no wonder that we should find here a flourishing school of music whose traditions have persisted until to this day. See, it is interesting to note that that was about this time that Gregory the Great was developing music in Europe for religious purposes. The Narada Shiksha wrongly connected with the name of the great Rishi was probably composed between the 10th and the 12th century. It shows considerable development upon the Natya Shastra in its Raga system and in a number of matters agrees with the Kundumiya Malai inscription where that disagrees with the next important thesis, the Sangita Ratnakara. Some scholars think that the Narada Shiksha comes much later than the 12th century. The first North Indian musician whom we can definitely locate both in time and place is Jayadeva, who lived at the end of the 12th century. He was born at Kedula, near Bolpur. Kendula still celebrates an annual fair at which the best musical pieces are regularly performed. Jayadeva wrote and sung the Gita Govinda, a series of songs descriptive of the armors of Krishna and so belongs to the number of Indian lyrical songsters connected with the Bhakti revival. Though each song has the name of the Raga and Thala to which it was sung, these are not intelligible today to Indian musicians. At that time, these songs were known as Prabandhas, 
The Geet Govinda is a charming lyrical composition as may be realized to some degree in an English translation of it by Sir Edwin Arnold under the name The Indian Song of Songs. In these songs, Radha pours forth her yearning, her sorrow and her joy and Krishna assures her of his love. We come now to the greatest of the ancient Indian musical authorities and one who still inspires reverence in the minds of Indian musicians. He was called Shrangadeva and lived in the former half of the 13th century, AD 1210-1247, at the court of the Yadava dynasty in Devagiri. And at the time, Maratha empire extended to the river Kaveri in the south and it was probable that Shrangadeva had come in contact with the music of South as well as with the North. His work, the Sangeet Ratnakar, shows many signs of this contact. So it is possible that he is endeavouring to give the common theory which underlines both systems. The result is that a great deal of controversy has arisen as to the exact system described in the book and even as to the reading of the ragas which he describes. No scholar has been able to give a thoroughly satisfactory account of these. The work deals with a whole range of musical form and composition and gives a very detailed account of ancient musical theory. And it also mentions a number of musical writers, but none of their works survive till date. The fundamental scale, Shuddharaga, of Shangadeva is Mukhari which is the Shuddha scale of Carnatic music today. The 14th and 15th centuries are the most important in the development of the northern school. That was the time of the Mohammedan conquest. Many of the empires did a great deal to extend the practice of music and most of them had musicians attached to their court. From this time, dates the introduction of Persian models into Indian music and we also find the differentiation of the northern and the southern schools becoming more marked. Amir Khusro was a famous singer at the court of Sultan Alauddin, AD 1295 to 1316. He was not only a poet and a musician but also a soldier and statesman and was a minister of two of the sultans. The Kavali mood of singing a judicious mixture of Persian and Indian models was introduced by him and several of our modern ragas are said to have been invented by him. The setar, a modification of the veena, was probably first introduced by him. There is a story told of a context of Amir Khusro and Gopal Naik, a musician from the court of Vijayanagaram. While Gopal was singing a beautiful composition, Khusro hid under the throne of the king and afterwards imitated all the beauties of Gopal's melodies and even surpassed them. The Muhammadan histories relate that when the Mughals completed the conquest of the Deccan, they took back with them to the north many of the most famous southern musicians in the same way that they took toll of the Indian architects and sculptures for their new buildings. The Raga Tarangini, composed by Lochana Kavi, probably belongs to this period. The major portion of this work is devoted to the discussion of a number of songs by a poet named Vidyapati who flourished in the 15th century at the court of Raja Shiva Singh of Tirhat. The author also describes the current musical theories of his day and groups the ragas under 12 tarts or fundamental modes. The development of the Bhakti revival in North India and Bengal under Chaitanya AD 1485-1533 was accompanied by a great deal of musical activity. And it was at this time that the popular musical performances known as Sankirtan and Nagar Kirtan was first started. The Emperor Akbar, AD 1542 to 165, was a fervent lover of music and did much for its development. 
During his reign, ragas were considerably modified under foreign influence and though some of these modifications transgressed and established practice, they were on the whole to the advantage of music and helped to give the northern music some of its more pleasing characteristics. Darbari or Chambur music was introduced in the time of the Emperor Akbar and from that time developed side by side with the music of the temple and the drama. Haridas Swami was a great Hindu saint and musician who lived at Vrindavan, the center of the Krishna cult on the banks of Yamuna in Akbar's reign. He was considered one of the greatest musicians of his time. Tansen, the celebrated singer of Akbar's court, was one of his pupils. Many interesting stories are told of Tansen, whose name is still fragrant throughout India and like whom there has been no singer for a thousand years. One of these tells how the emperor, after one year of his performances, asked him if there was anyone in the world who could sing like him. Tansen replied that there was one who far surpassed him. And once the emperor was all excited to hear this other singer and when told that he would not even obey the command of the emperor to come to the court, he asked to be taken to him. So it was necessary for the emperor to go in disguise as the humble instrument carrier of his singer. They came to the hermitage of of Haridas Swami on the banks of Jamuna, and Tansen asked him to sing, but he refused. Then Tansen practiced a little trick and himself sung a piece before his old master, making a slight mistake in doing so. The master at once called his attention to it and showed him how to sing it properly, and then went on in a wonderful burst of song, while the emperor Akbar listened enraptured. Afterwards, as they were going back to the palace, the emperor said to Tansen, Why cannot you sing like that? I have to sing whenever my emperor commands, said Tansen. But he only sings in obedience to his inner voice. Raja Mansingh of Gwalior, one of the greatest of Akbar's ministers, were also a great patron of music and is said to have introduced the Drupad style of singing. The Gwalior court has maintained its high musical traditions to the present day. The disciples of Tansen divided themselves into two groups, Harababiyars and Binkars. The former used the new instrument invented by Tansen, the Rabab, while the latter used Bin, as the Veena is called in the north. Two descendants of these are living today at Rampur, a small state which has been famous for many centuries for its excellent musicians. The representatives of Binkars is Muhammad Wazir Khan, whose paternal ancestor was Nabi Khan Binkar at the court of the Emperor Muhammad Shah and Muhammad Ali Khan, the representative of the Rababiyars. The heroic Mirabai, 1500, the famous poetess and musician and Tulsidas, 1584. The singer and composer of the Hindi Ramayana are representatives of musical culture in North India. Pundarika Vithal was probably another musician of Akbar's time. He lived at Bhuranpur in Khandesh and may have been asked to go over to Delhi when Akbar took Khandesh in 1599. It appears that the music of the Upper India was getting into confusion and Pundarika seems to have been asked by Raja Barhan Khan to bring things into order. Pundarika was a Sadhan Pandit and he himself states calling himself Karnataka or belonging to the South. And so he had come to know both the Northern and the Southern systems. He adopts the Shuddha scale of the South and describes many Northern Ragas. In describing his Ragas, he seems to make use of only 14 Shrutis in the octave and uses only 12 frets of his Vina. Rama Amartya, a Southern musician, gives us the first detailed exposition of the Southern system in the Swaramela Kalanidhi.
written about the year AD 1550. This work contains the first collection of Indian ragas which are adequately described. All of them belong to the Carnatic system and, and have Sa as their tonic. It seems that in the south, at least, ragas have now been worked out from a common tonic, indicating that instrumental music had greatly developed. Following this comes the Raga Vidova, one of the most important works on Indian music written in 1609 by Somnatha, Telugu Brahman of the east coast, probably of Raja Mandri. He was evidently a practical musician as well as a scholar and poet. The book is written in masterly couplets of the Arya meter. It starts with a theory of musical sounds and goes on to describe the different veenas in existence and how to sing them. The names and positions of the 22 Shrutis are mentioned. Somnatha belongs to the southern school and classifies the ragas into primary and derivative, as is done modern South Indian music. He also gives a number of melodies developed from the ragas. A translation of this work was appearing in the Indian music journal when it met with an untimely death. Another important work of the Southern School which was written about the same time in the Chaturdandi Prakashika, whose author was Pandit Venkatamaki, son of Govinda Dikshit and pupil of Dhanabacharya, who is said to carry his scholastic succession right back to Shangadeva himself. This work gives the basis of the present-day Southern system and also of its Raga classification. The Ragas are arranged under 72 primary Ragas with a large number of subordinate Ragas attached to each. This author makes use of the 12 semitones only in describing the Ragas. In Northern school, Sangeet Darpan or The Mirror of Music is a popular work written by Damodar Mishra at AD 1625 when Jahangir was empire. This book has become an unintelligible as Sangeet Ratnakar, from which the author has freely copied most of his materials for the chapter on Swaras. He has added a chapter on Ragas which is copied from some unknown author. Various pictorial descriptions of the different ragas are given. There were many good musicians at the court of Shah Jahan from 1628 to 66, among them being Jagannath who received the title Kaviraja and Lal Khan who was a descendant of Tansen. We are told that on one occasion Jagannath and another musicians named Tirang Khan received from the empire their weight in silver which amounted to about Rs. 4,500. During the reign of Aurangzeb, music went out of favour in the royal court. A story is told of how the court musicians, desiring to draw the empire's attention to their distressful condition, came past to his balcony carrying a gaily dressed corpse upon a bier and chanting mournful funeral songs. Upon the emperor, inquiring what the matter was, they told that music had died from neglect and that they were taking its corpse to the burial ground. He replied at once, very well, make the grave deep, so that neither the voice nor echo may issue from it. The Sangeeta Parijata, one of the most important works of the Northern School, was written by Ahobala Pandit in the 17th century. That was translated into Persian in the year 1724. Ahobala seems to have had access to both Raga Tarangini and the Raga Vebodha. The Shuddha scale of the Parijata is the same as that of the Tarangini. Ahobala recognizes 29 Shrutis altogether in the octave, but he rarely uses more than 12 to 